So let's talk about surviving and prospering during a bear market. Now, this was left over from some slides I did in 2020. And it's just kind of interesting how trading like life, it can go south really fast. If you'd have told me a month ago that I'd be stuck at home binge watching a series about a gun toting redneck on meth with a dyed blonde mullet who's a polygamous homosexual, not that there's, not that there's anything wrong with that, <laughs> who runs a zoo with over 200 tigers and is fighting with a murdering crazy, Biatch, his opinion, who has quite a few tigers herself. Anyway... That was just a couple of years ago we were going through that. So it does happen and it does go south quickly. The number one thing you need to do is don't panic. Now, tops feel like an event, but more often than not, they are not. Unless, of course, you wait for the bomb to blow up. And I've been preaching about that since last summer. And that's why I did a presentation called Before the Bomb blows up because everyone calls me when the market is down 30% asking me what to do. In fact, a few days ago, I told a couple of my buddies, we were working out, like, you know, i got a sell signal. And they, they just kind of like, oh, okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> and I guarantee you, a month from now, or two months from now, or three months from now, if this market's down 34%, then they're going to want to know what to do. Now, the... Interesting thing is, again, markets tops just seem like an event, but they do take some time. And Greg Morris has talked about this before, but a top is actually more of a process than an event. And the bottom, believe it or not, is kind of an event versus a process. Not all the time, but just in general. If we look at the high back in 2008 on the S&P 500, notice that it took a while, several weeks, to get down to the 10% line, meaning that on a closing basis, it took 33 trading days to close 10% below that close. And what's interesting, that high close, what's interesting is it did bounce from there, and then it was two and a half months total before it dropped back below 10% again. And I'm gonna talk a lot about how important that 10% level is in a few minutes. So let's take a look at the S&P 500 recently. And you can see that it took about two months to get down to the 10% line. In fact, it just closed there last week. And if we fast forward to 2020, when we had the pandemic bear market. Now that one unfolded a little bit quicker, but you can see it did take over a week to get below 10%. And then it bounced back up. And then it was about two weeks total before it was back below 10%. Once again, actually, this needs to be a little bit hard. It needs to be right here. But the one thing that's kind of interesting is the market did lose steam for a long, long time. You can see it sort of topped out in here. This high was just kind of a marginal high, not much higher than it was back several months earlier. So there was a little bit of rollover that was happening. And as I said ad nauseum, what really impressed me about this longer term sell signal is that we it triggered before a lot of the shorter term signals such as the daily bow ties. Now you might be wondering about the crash of 1987. Well, this was pretty interesting because the market made all time highs here and it took a while, about two and a half months before it dropped below the 10% line. In other words, for two and a half months, it was within 90% of its all time highs and then you could see things went south really quick once it got past that 10% level, which, again, we'll talk about quite a bit. Now, if you go all the way back to the Great Depression, you can see the market made new highs. And I guess that was September of 1929. And economy ended for a while. And then finally, about a month or so later, it did close 10% below that level. And let's say that you didn't get shaken out then. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to wait for another signal. And then you have a second signal here. You can see about two months total 
from that peak. So even though the Great Depression was a crash, so to speak, it actually took a long time before the market rolled over. Two months, in fact. Number two, I will see each position to its fruition. And this is something I talked about a couple of weeks back. And I also talked about it in the week in charts a couple of weeks back, too. The dotted line in this chart is the S&P 500. The blue line is ARLP. That's the stock that we were long coming into the slide. And the orange line is APG. Now, you can see, obviously, the market tanked seriously since then. And also, the stock, APG, failed miserably. Now, the good news is we were profitable overall. I think we were up about 70% on that position. But we were up, I believe, triple digits, if memory serves, before that market began to roll over. And by the way, if you want to see all these trades without any benefit of hindsight, you can go to daylearner.com slash archives, and you can see them each day that I recommended them. Now, what's kind of interesting is the ARLP started making new highs after the market was all already down substantially, and it's since given up some of those gains, but in more recent times, it's starting to rally again, so it's not dead yet. <laughs> I'm not dead yet. I think I'll go for a walk. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get to here is not every time, but over time, if you just follow your original plan and honor your stops, because you never know what stock's going to actually take off, and the outlier is key when you are trend following. And just as important, if you bail on all your positions every time the market gets a little iffy, you're going to end up being out and then watch the market and your individual stocks take off without you. Number three, be leery of asset gatherers with their sage advice. A friend of mine a few years back, he's an ex-broker and he's actually a client who I became friendly with. But anyway, he told me back in his brokerage days, he realized at some point he was nothing more than an asset gatherer and he wanted to become something more than that. He wanted to learn how to trade. But the asset gatherers in general tend to drink the same Kool-Aid. And they all tend to have this sage advice. They'll tell you, oh, you can't lose your position. The market always goes up longer term. Well, yeah, that's true. It really is. But as I learned from Greg Morris and a lot of empirical research long before I knew who Greg Morris was, the longer term could be a long, long, long time. In fact, according to Greg... The longer term buy and hold metrics are based on an 81 year time horizon. And quoting Sweet Brown, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> now, this is what I heard recently, and I kind of like it a little bit. So I, I was hesitant to put it in here. Michael Saylor said this, and he's a huge Bitcoin bull. And I think I'm a Bitcoin bull longer term, but I do find myself short Bitcoin every now. And then I think eventually I might hodl a little bit, but volatility is the cost of performance. And I think they kind of spin that to make you think that, hey, it's okay to lose 30 or 40 or 50 percent of your money every now and then because longer term, the market's going to go up. Right. And unfortunately, the market is a really bad teacher. And I can think of many examples before the pandemic where people told me, man, I'm so glad I held on. And that's one of those things that'll work until it don't. Now, if you go back to the S&P 500 and you go all the way back to the 30s, you can see obviously the Great Depression peak is there. It took about 25 or 26 years for the market to make back all of its losses. Now, a lot of times people think, well, that was then, this is now. But look no further than 2009. And by the way, you'll get a copy of the Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks. And there's a lot of this type of information that warns the perils of buy and hold in the first chapter. And I think it's called 10 Myths About Wall Street or You've Been Lied To or something like that. But anyway, I'd encourage you to read that book. And it's absolutely free if you go to daylinercom slash stock charts. Anyway, going way back in time, the market hit 13-year lows. And I think the significance of this is, let's say you had a little toddler and you didn't have a whole lot of money for the first three or four years because, like, dang, these kids are pretty expensive. 
And at some point, you about three or four years old, you're like, man, I better start saving for this kid's future. I better save for his college, right? And then all of a sudden, it's about time for him to go to college. And this market is hitting 13 years lows. It's lower than when you started saving. So that's kind of a, a scary thing when it comes to markets. Now, don't get me wrong. When the market is going up, I'm the bullish guy, the most bullish guy in bullish town. And, and I've got some relatives, specifically one in-law I'm thinking about. She only asks me about the market when the market is really crappy. And I tell her what I think. And she gets mad at me and says, ah, you always, you're always a bear. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, ask me about the market when it's going up. Now, one thing I would encourage you not to do is don't try to catch falling knives. I've been in presentations before where one in, one in particular where they were speaking a different language and I wasn't sure exactly what they were saying. But the gist of it, from what I could tell, was this gentleman was suggesting selling puts once a market was down so far. And I can assure you that'll work until it don't. So don't bottom fish. Don't try to catch a falling knife. If something seems low, it could go a hell of a lot lower. And if you think about it from an emotional standpoint, if a market has been dropping, it's putting pressure on people to possibly sell stock because people have bills to pay and things they might need. They might need to sell some stock to pay for junior's college. And if the market keeps dropping, sooner or later they could be forced out. Now, you only have to go back to the NASDAQ in 2002 to see that it had lost half of its value. And at that point in time, you're probably thinking, hey, that's pretty cheap. It's 50% it's off, right? It's on sale. I should rush in and buy the NASDAQ. Well, if you would have done that just a few months later, you would have lost over half of your money. It went down another 50% from there. Charlie Vallejo and Michael Gaird once did a presentation or a paper, I forget which it was, but they basically said that bad things happen below the 200-day moving average. And my corollary to that is bad things happen below the 10% line. Now, if you think about what these gentlemen are saying, is that once a market is weak, it has the potential to get a lot weaker. Now, in my case, the 10% line is a 50-week closing high less 10%, and that's in the ACP platform. Now, I thought it was kind of interesting. This is a chart I've used before. You could see some really bad things happen, not all the time, but fairly often once the market drops 10%. In fact, the whole basis of the TFM 10% system is that if a market is going to drop 50%, it's going to have to drop 10% first. So once it drops about 10%, with a few caveats, you might want to think about getting out. Now, obviously, the Great Depression is in here where the market lost 80% or so of its value. But remember, the NASDAQ, as I just showed, lost about 70-something percent of its value in 2000. 2009, you had about a 50% haircut. And then if you go to 2020, we were down around 30-something percent. And obviously, after 10%, the market continued to slide. Now, it came back. Thank goodness. You know, I'm not a bear. I don't want to be a bear. But, or perma bear, I should say. But when things start getting ugly, the old hedge fund adage comes to mind. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Now, one thing you have to realize is that bad things can happen in any market. In fact, all asset classes will lose half of their value at some point in your lifetime. I was looking at gold and some other commodities. The S&P 500 has lost half its value at least twice in my lifetime. And I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? <laughs> Keep in mind that markets don't adhere to statistics. In other words, they're not normally distributed. And the point I'm trying to make there is that markets go down a lot more than they should. They have much, much bigger haircuts, fat tails, so to speak, than they should. They shouldn't lose 50% as often as they do, but they do.